So we started the trip in Changchun. That's where we rented our car from. Um, and this was back in August of 2019. So we followed it. It's about 4,000 kilometers in total, the border length. Uh, it spans three provinces. So Heilongjiang, um, Jilin, and Neymong in Mongolia. Uh, so we went through almost, I would say, definitely every major city and almost every small town along the border. Um, we spent six, almost six weeks doing the trip. So the two key objectives of the trip were number one, to visit as many BRI sites as we could, to try to get a sense of what the Belt and Road actually means for locals. Um, and number two, we also wanted to get a sense of what the China-Russia relationship is like at sites of actual significance along the border. Mm -hmm. So as, as you may know, this year marks the 70th anniversary of China and Russia's diplomatic ties. Uh, we wanted to go visit some of the most important locations where this relationship has been realized in practice and to see uh, how those have changed over time. I think it's hard to pick out isolated examples of people that we spoke with because we spoke with such a range of, of people from different professions, different uh, walks of life. We spoke with construction workers who were building BRI projects. We also spoke with uh, local officials who were actually helping to organize and lead the projects. We had an opportunity to sit down and have lunch with some He Zhezhu, this ethnic minority group in the eastern edge of the northeastern region of China. Uh, and it was just a very interesting uh, experience because we got to see how this group of people think about their own identity, their own relationship to being Chinese. And I think we're really spending a lot of time now thinking about that experience and seeing how we can uh, maybe turn it into some sort of a product that we can share with the YCA community and the broader community. We reached this site and it appeared to be some kind of museum commemorating this ethnic minority and it appeared to be closed but we just wandered in and eventually they invited us in to have lunch with their family so they weren't working that day. Uh, and how do I phrase this delicately? I was trying to engage with the local customs during lunch, which not only meant eating everything they were eating, but also meant drinking everything they were drinking. So Vivek very kindly offered to drive that day. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I had a very good time uh, drinking with the Hojo people. <laughs> so we went to an international exposition actually in Suifenhu and we got to visit all of these different trade boots from people uh, from around the world, even traders from Pakistan and India were there. I mean, this was shocking because this was we, quite amazing. We, we entered the expo thinking this is fantastic. I mean, we're going to see some cross-border Russia-China trade. Um, and the first people we met were from India. Um, yeah. Yeah. What was really amazing was that you could see that this area that seems like it's so remote, is on a frontier, is just so far away from uh, China's main economic centers. You can see that even this kind of a place is now very important for Chinese policy and Chinese foreign relations. Yeah, so this will, what, what's great about this research is I study high level relations between China and Russia, but it's so important for me personally to get a sense of the on the ground dynamics between people to people connections and cultural exchange, because for me that's a very vital part of kind of wider power dynamics. So though the research might not directly feed into my, my thesis exactly, it gives me a much more um, comprehensive picture of what I'm writing about. If you look at a lot of analyses of the Belt and Road or any other major policy that has come out of China in the past uh, five, 10 years, a lot of it will focus on the high level issues or the implications for international relations without really touching on locals and local people's lives. So one of the things that this project is able to do is it gives a little bit of balance to that. It's a little bit of a corrective because we get a sense of what locals, traders, construction workers, and so on, what locals are actually experiencing when this kind of a project goes through. So 7,000 kilometers worth of roads, and the roads are very, very well developed. Um, now, some of these road networks owe their funding to BRI. Some of them owe their funding to the Asian Development Bank. Um, but it's just amazingly well connected, I think. I think if you're looking at 50 years ago, um, and I've spoken to people who've grown up in these regions, and at that time there was no roads connecting some of the most far out regions on the border to places like Changchun, uh, Harbin, all of these bigger cities. Whereas now you've got Gautia, you've got um, these, um, sorry, high-speed rail, you've got uh, these motorways connecting all of the smallest places, which is really quite amazing, I think. Um, so we also had a chance to speak with some representatives from a train company based out of Zhengzhou. So these train companies are very heavily involved in the Belt and Road Initiative, and they help uh, essentially expedite the process of shipping goods from China to Europe and back by way of these Belt and Road projects. 
so from our discussions, we were able to learn that there's a lot of uh, interest and excitement in seeing how these projects can relate back to uh, cross-border trade, not just with regard to Russia and China, but with regard to other countries throughout Asia. So I have two trips in mind, I think. The most obvious follow-up trip would be to do the other side of the yes. border now. Um, it would be very interesting. I think it would be a very different type of trip. Um, I wonder if we'd be relying on, I don't know if we'd be able to drive, for instance, with the ease with which we were able to drive on this trip. Um, but I think that there would be a lot of interesting angles to look at that. I feel as though on this trip, we've got quite a good sense of the Chinese perspective on the border, but not enough of the Russian perspective. So we applied for YCA's uh, Opportunity Grant. It's a really good, I felt personally, opportunity to build on my Dean's Grant, which is available to first year scholars. Um, so many of us in April, May went on Dean's Grant research and did shorter projects for two or three days to a week. Whereas the Opportunity Grant, I felt, gave us more breadth to do something on this scale, a much bigger project. So I think perhaps more than the actual funding that YCA provides, uh, YCA is also a good platform from which to connect with other people who can then support you when you do this kind of a journey, either financially or in terms of getting local contacts, or even just in terms of uh, you know, listening to your ideas and giving you feedback so that you can polish them and have a better proposal. Um, I think YCA just has this community that really supports people when they go, go out and do these kinds of independent projects.